Imaging Conference. Um, Dr. William Zogby, Chief of Cardiology here at Houston Methodist. And Happy New Year to everyone. Hopefully this year will be a healthier one and uh, we'll see you know, prospect and, and success uh, in everyone's uh, life and, and better health. Um, today uh, we will start actually this year by addressing the topic of myocardial viability and it's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome also my uh, associates here at Houston Methodist, uh, Dr. Moaz al Malah, who's the director of the cardiovascular uh, PET imaging program at Houston Methodist, and Dr. Deepan Shah, director of cardiovascular imaging and also the cardiovascular magnetic resonance uh, laboratory at Houston Methodist. So what we wanted to do today is, is to give you an overview on myocardial viability from every modality point of view because these are available for you nowadays uh, and, and particularly in a, in a specific patient with depressed ventricular function and ischemic heart disease as to assess myocardial viability. We'll go through their accuracy, where do you see their, uh, their use, and hopefully you'll have access to these modalities yourself in your programs. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, a historical um, picture, if you will. Uh, it's interesting that it's been 40 years since uh, the concept actually was, uh, was not only advanced but also emphasized by Dr., the late Dr. Rahim Tula uh, in uh, some investigations early on uh, after bypass surgery, noticed that the ventricular function had improved significantly and it improved a bit after nitroglycerin. Many, many investigations since then with invasive technology and imaging technologies. And nowadays, basically, we have uh, many of these non-invasive modalities, starting with an electrocardiogram, and we'll talk a bit about that, in addition to echocardiography, stress testing and otherwise, contrast, cardiovascular PET, which has the advantage of uh, assessing metabolism in addition to perfusion, uh, regular nuclear, and also importantly, cardiovascular MRI, which uh, has the distinct advantage of imaging a scar as opposed to inferring a scar uh, from either metabolism or function. So I think we have an amazing array of technologies and modalities for us to be able to use. And the question is, how do we do that? And uh, maybe also a bit about the pathophysiology of this disease of myocardial hibernation or viability in a chronic ischemic syndrome. Is if actually, if you take a look at biopsies from patients with this uh, entity, you may have from minimal if you will, myocardial disarray and fibrosis to a completed infarction and somewhere in between. And, uh, you know, just imaging the heart with regular imaging, you won't be able to differentiate what the dysfunction and underlying mechanism of the dysfunction is in a chronic ischemic syndrome, if you will. And that's why the importance of adding something to the imaging modality to, uh, to substantiate the involvement and how much viability there is. Now, the goals of viability assessment, certainly identifying patients that would benefit from the revascularization, predicting recovery, although the vast majority of this recovery of function have been at rest, except maybe one from our institution looking at the myocardial reserve that occurs after revascularization, but most importantly, clinically nowadays, is that in advanced heart failure to help predict and decide on management, revascularization versus VAD transplantation or uh, some you know, challenging uh, chronic total occlusions that an individual may decide to go after and whether is it, is it uh, uh, important to do and how much viability there is in, in such a patient. So the indicators of viability, yes, if somebody has angina, it already tells you that there is you know, viability in case uh, you, know, uh, you have a dysfunctional myocardium. Lack of Q waves in the appropriate scenario, and the appropriate scenario dysfunction with a lot of ischemic uh, burden. Hypokinesis as opposed to akinesis because there is thickening already. Contractile reserve which appears to be paradoxical initially because how can you have uh, contractile reserve still on an ischemic myocardium? Radionuclide uptake, uh, 
PET imaging and mismatch, and we'll talk about that, inducible ischemia. Anytime you have inducible ischemia, be it while motion or perfusion, it is an indicator of viability. And no or minimal delayed uh, enhancement uh, with gadolinium on CMR. So a lack of Q-wave in ischemic cardiomyopathy is indeed specific for viability. So if you're on rounds and you have a patient who is known to have ischemic heart disease with a cardiomyopathy or significant dysfunction, uh, if you have no Q-waves, a lack of Q-waves is very predictive, very specific. So I think w do not discount that when you put together the information regarding a patient and viability. It is rather specific. Now for echocardiography, yes, we use dobutamine echocardiography to elicit a contractile reserve. Notice that in this protocol here, we emphasize lower doses of dobutamine because the ischemic threshold may be rather low and you may not have as much contractile reserve. And it's interesting that because of alterations in beta receptors, also TNF-alpha that has been measured from our institutions and others, uh, that you may have down regulation and still some contractile reserve that can be elicited with lower doses of dobutamine. Now the interesting thing is if you continue towards higher doses, 10, 20, or 30 mics of dobutamine, you may elicit an ischemic response, which is called a biphasic response, improvement and then worsening, which is the most specific for recovery of function and that, that this dysfunction that you're seeing is because of repetitive, repetitive ischemia on, on such a patient. Let's take a look at as, uh, this example here. So the display is rest five micrograms of dobutamine, 10 mics, and maximal dose. And you could see some improvement at low dose, some worsening at high dose in this individual. And the reason why we mix lower doses a bit, if you can, is that you're not gonna get 100% uh, contractile reserve elicitation at a particular dose. And this is the dosimetry of 2.5, 5, 7.5, 10, 20, et cetera, mics. And you could see that the maximal contractile reserve that was observed in this investigation from Dr. Afridi when he was with us many years ago is between 7.5 and 10 mics. So in our laboratory, we, sh we display five, 10 mics, and maximal dose of dobutamine. The types of dobutamine responses that you get are also predictive in a different way uh, regarding recovery of function after revascularization. So uh, the description that we've done many years ago, biphasic response, worsening, straight worsening, no contractile reserve in the minority of cases, sustained improvement or no change. And the implications of what you see uh, qualitatively or even quantitatively is with a biphasic response, it has the most prediction for recovery of function after revascularization, followed by just an ischemic response of worsening. So you start with hypokinesis and go to akinesis or dyskinesis. Notice that even if you have sustained improvement at high doses, you're not gonna get much recovery of function because this segment, be it completely infarcted or tethered, is not ischemic, so revascularization may not improve it. Now, this is a dichotomous, if you will, uh, uh, classification. If I have a biphasic response versus any improvement, it, as would be expected, the sensitivity would be a little higher than just a biphasic response and specificity would be lower. So many investigators or laboratories use up just to 10 mics per kilo uh, of dobutamine and look at the improvement response, not biphasic response, and that's fine in somebody who may be uh, uh, unstable, if you will, or prone to arrhythmias, but uh, you're trading a bit sensitivity for specificity. Now, what we talked about has been evaluated qualitatively, and you could quantitate this nowadays with uh, the availability of strain and strain rate imaging. Uh, these are early data from uh, Dr. Tom Marwick, and a few other data have been in the literature, uh, looking at qualitative versus quantitative assessment of, of such. And the augmentation of wall motion qualitatively uh, was predictor of viability in addition to the strain rate quantitated at low dose dobutamine and how much of that has occurred with dobutamine. So basically, you could use it qualitatively, 
and you could add maybe uh, some uh, prediction to quantitative technique using using stress uh, stra strain rate, if you will, and uh, that you could use with dopamine. Now, interestingly enough, there are a few things that you could use at rest. The myocardial thickness, and I know you will hear from Dr. Shah that uh, there may be situations where a thin myocardium can still be viable, but the vast majority, uh, as you will see, may not have as much viability when the myocardium becomes very thin, particularly regionally. So this is a case here where you could see there is thinness of the myocardium. We've done an investigation with uh, when Dr. Josalea Shuai was here from Brazil, and uh, this is uh, data on thickness and uh, uh, diastolic wall thickness versus uh, wall motion on, uh, as well as perfusion. And perfusion is on the right side using rest redistribution thallium imaging with worse and worse wall motion on the x-axis, you have less thickness as well as less myocardial uptake with rest redistribution thallium. And a 6 millimeter or below uh, threshold for thickness uh, is a highly predictive of less viable myocardium, not 100%, as you will see, but uh, also it corresponds to a thallium uptake of close to 60% in these situations. So yes, you could add it, and this is obviously you know, a bona fide presence there. If you're gonna use the butamine, you could take a look at the resting thickness per se, in addition to the wall motion change with the butamine stress echocardiography to try to improve your overall predictive accuracy for recovery of function and viability of such. So you could use them together. Uh, and last, I'm gonna cover perfusion and diastolic function. Uh, using contrast echo, you could look at perfusion, and we've done several investigations here in the past. We're not using it clinically as much nowadays, but as you know, with destruction and replenishment of contrast, you can take a look at velocity in addition to coronary blood flow in that myocardial bed uh, with various parameters, the beta, the beak, myocardial uh, uh, contrast uh, intensity, as well as the product. And you could see that those individuals with recovery of function uh, had a, a, you know, still a better perfusion than those who had no recovery of function uh, in green. Now, uh, this was an investigation in the same patients of myocardial contrast qualitative on the left side, quantitative, then comparing in the same patients, rest redistribution thallium, so about the same as perfusion techniques. Uh, of rest redistribution thallium. Notice the difference in these same patients between perfusion and wall motion contractile reserve. Biphasic response, less sensitive but more specific, and any improvement, higher sensitivity, specificity certainly lower. So it depends what you really want. If you want something that is very specific, uh, the, probably the most specific is uh, from this investigations is dobutamine biphasic response, higher sensitivity with lower specificity, perfusion imaging, or dobutamine, any improvement. Diastolic function parameters can also help you. Uh, bottom line here is if you have a pattern on the left side, which is a slow relaxation, less you know, restrictive filling compared to a restrictive filling pattern, a slow relaxation pattern, is much more indicative of viability. And these are from early data from Dr. Young from our institution here, looking at deceleration time and contractile reserve. Um, also patients with group one who had a long deceleration time, basically a not restrictive pattern, have less interstitial fibrosis, have better contractile reserve, more change in EF after surgery, revascularization, lesser ICU stay, better New York Heart Association after lesser admissions for heart failure as with less death or transplantation. So in summary, from this portion of the talk today, regarding echocardiography, detection contractile reserve is a good marker for myocardial viability. Ischemia induction during the butamine biphasic or worsening conveys a higher likelihood for recovery of function. Now you could use myocardial thickness, which can refine your evaluation of viability. Uh, 
And last is contrast echo improves the accuracy of detection of quality, of, of viability, but quantitation is needed for such an evaluation. And nowadays, I think with the availability of other techniques, we're using less of that uh, because of other techniques have uh, a bit more reliable and less intensive from a, uh, from a technique point of view, if you will. So I'm going to stop here and probably ask Dr. Almala to take over and give us a feel about uh, where do we stand uh, from a nuclear cardiology perspective in our assessment of viability. Moaz? Thanks, Dr. Zabi. And can you hear me well and see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. All right, so I'm tasked to talk to you about the nuclear perspective of assessment of viability. But before that, I just want to give you a uh, more of a general background. When do you need viability imaging in general? Uh, because recently we've seen kind of relative decline in the utilization of this technique for appropriate reasons, because many patients, you don't need viability before making a decision for revascularization. So as Dr. Zabi mentioned, patients with class 2 angina or more, they will need to go for revascularization. If you have moderate to severe ischemia and LV dysfunction, if you have normal uh, ejection fraction, these patients technically uh, telling you that, this, that the symptoms they're having is coming from viable myocardium patients with left main coronary disease or those who have no limited comorbidities. The typical patients that come to the uh, nuclear lab, at least for assessment of viability, are those where there is an equipose. Older patients, multiple comorbidities, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the LV is dilated, it appears to be a difficult procedure, not very good targets, chronic total occlusions, and these are the patients where the surgeon or the interventionalist would need more information before they go ahead and make a decision about revascularization and the extent of revascularization. As you heard, there are multiple uh, techniques that can be used for that. In general, this is from a meta-analysis published nearly 15 years ago, nuclear techniques have showed high sensitivity compared to the vitamin echo, which you just heard about. The vitamin echo, uh, looking at contractile reserve, has higher specificity, but nuclear techniques, especially FTG PET, has shown the highest sensitivity uh, in terms of assessment of myocardial viability. I'm going to touch quickly on spec techniques, mainly for the fellows, although we are trying not to do them as often or only in special circumstances, but they are still used in practice and they are still heavily tested on board. So it's very important for the fellows to know about these. And you can test the cell membrane integrity using thallium or technetium or nitrate enhanced thallium or technetium. And for metabolism is primarily by PET, FTG and acetate. These are the protocols. Either you bring the patient to the nuclear lab, you do a rest spec, then you wait three hours, get another image, and then wait another four hours and uh, get another image. For, uh, uh, if you want to get stress imaging, then you can do rest followed by stress and then redistribution later on. And there are different iterations of these protocols, but this is kind of the main uh, protocol that is used. So stress, as you see here, the four-hour redistribution followed by 24-hour redistribution. And you can see here that there is a perfusion defect in the inferior wall. It starts to fill in at 24 hours and then fill in almost completely at uh, 24 hours here. 
Uh, technetium is more widely available. It does allow for good image quality, especially in overweight and obese patients. It has good predictive value. However, it is not as good for viability imaging because it does not redistribute compared to thallium. So if you're going to use technetium, then it is must to use nitro. So this is not an option. Nitro may be an option with thallium, but is a must with technetium. And this is a protocol. You start with nitro, then you inject the high-dose technetium and then image them at uh, one hour. Or you can do a rest first followed by stress or stress followed by rest. And there have been some studies that compared spec by uh, uh, by um, uh, viability for by technetium compared to thallium and showed that nearly 40% of what was called by vi- non-viable by thallium was changed to viable by technetium. Obviously, it depends on the patient population and the uh, type of patients you're imaging. Um, and this is one example why we kind of tried to switch away from SPEC techniques. This is a patient that I've seen in my care, and this is her thallium images. And you can see, based on this, there is no anterior wall, no apical apex seen here, and there's no perfusion. The only wall that's well perfused is the lateral wall, and this patient was liable, labeled as scar in the entire LED territory and most of the RCA territory. This patient had the rubidium PET just three years later after multiple hospital admissions. And we had at that time cardiac PET. And you can see just by perfusion, there is only a small defect in the apex, but rather not as bad as it appeared on the thallium inviability imaging, which gives you an example in the same patient, despite after three years of imaging, there is significant <coughs> There is significant reduction uh, in perfusion uh, by thallium compared to to uh, rubidium PET. So, and even in this study, they found out even comparing technetium to FTG, nearly 25% of segments were classified as viable by FTG, and they were not classified before by uh, technetium. So how does PET work? And this is what we are doing most often and the fellows are used to ordering these now as well as our surgeons and interventionalists. So for those of you who are eating right now, before you started your meal, you probably didn't have much insulin in your uh, meal. So your heart preferred to use fatty acid. The hibernating myocardium, however, was using glucose because it kind of switch when it's hibernating. Now, after you started your meal, your blood sugar, serum sugar went up, your insulin went up, the entire heart, including the hibernating myocardium, now is utilizing glucose. So we try to mimic that in the PET lab by giving the patients glucose so we can drive their insulin level out, up, but also at the same time try to uh, push FTG inside the cells so to kind of maximize the uptake of FTG. FTG is fluorodeoxyglucose, so we take glucose and just attach to it F18 in our cyclotron in the research institute, and then it goes inside the cell and gets stuck inside because it doesn't go into the Krebs cycle, which you remember from your biochemistry classes. So this is kind of a nice schematic that tells you about um, the different mechanisms of how the different uh, targets for viability imaging. Thallium, we're looking at sodium potassium ATPAs because it's a potassium analog. Rubidium, it's the same. Technetium orthotrophosphate, looking at the mitochondria. Ammonia is diffusing in there uh, for perfusion. And FTG goes inside by uptake like glucose, but then gets stuck inside the cell. So we know that the membrane is intact and metabolism is intact. That's why it took glucose. The vitamin obviously works on the uh, myosin channel uh, to allow for contraction and Dr. Shaw will cover gadolinium, which doesn't even go inside the sun. It's more of an extracellular agent.
So how do we do that? After we do perfusion imaging, we start what we call a period of glucose manipulation. Uh, there's a protocol that our nurses now are pro into, and they do it every day. And uh, there is, we started with the oral glucose loading. That's kind of the easier one, but there is also the IV clamp. And outside the US, there is a medication that they use, which is called Acipomox, which is very helpful. This is not FDA approved. So once we give them glucose, we measure their sugar every 20 to 25 minutes. And based on this table, we inject the glucose insulin until we get to the level of 140 milligram per deciliter. And this is where we inject our glucose. And uh, our FTG glucose we inject now because we have a, a higher sensitivity system. We inject even lower dose than this. So we're mostly in the seven to eight kind of milli, uh, millicuries. Once we inject it, we wait for 30 minutes, uh, sorry, for 60 minutes, and then we image the patients. One group that might challenge us are diabetic patients. So we moved on for these patients specifically uh, to IV dextrose. And in some sites, they use the clamp specifically for that. These are not available as options in the US. But this is where the clamp is more nursing intensive because then it has to be one to one nurse per patient. There is a recent study that came from WashU, very uh, interesting, and we adopted that in our practice, where were they using IV glucose on everybody? And based on that, you're able to get the entire period of glucose manipulation down to 51 minutes. We've seen this in our practice when we adopted this, and we can improve the throughput of the lab by utilizing IV glucose. However, the glucose will go up quickly and come down quickly, so we have to be very careful about when we adopt that so we are sure that we don't develop, the patients don't develop hypoglycemia, and uh, it requires good nursing monitoring of the patient. So when you do that, you see that there is a perfusion defect. And when we look at metabolism, then we could see a transmural scar here. So we call that a match defect. It's a match between flow and metabolism. It could be hibernating myocardium because you could see a perfusion defect, but then there is FTG uptake in there. So you know that this myocardium is viable. And then finally, you could see a, what we call reverse mismatch, which is hypothesized to be more related to stunning from a uh, specific lesion there. This is like one case from our lab where we see a match defect, no uptake here, and there is like clear uptake, no uptake in the FTG part. This is a, one of the patients that has the most match uh, mismatch or hibernating, hibernation. So you can see a large anterior defect, but there is significant viability in this LED territory, and this patient would benefit from revascularization. It's very important that these protocols are followed up very well because, for example, in this patient, we did everything by the book, by the protocol. And then we, when we got the FTG images, we couldn't see anything in the uh, myocardium. It was all in the blood pool. And after some investigation, this case happened during my training. After some investigation, we found out that once we injected the FTG, the patient should not get any unlabeled glucose. We try our best to avoid any unlabeled glucose, so no feeding. But this patient managed to sneak in some food, and his unlabeled glucose increased, so his labeled glucose stayed in the myocardium. So it is very important that we follow the protocol, and if we need to give the patient develops hypoglycemia, we give the minimum amount just to get them out of the symptoms. And this is another challenge. In diabetic patients, you need to give a lot of glucose. So this is a patient, for example, that's published in the literature where they could not get FTG uh, viability simply because they only injected eight units of insulin. In diabetics, our experience is that these patients need a lot of glucose uh, of insulin. So you need to inject a lot of insulin before you get them to be able to switch uh, to get the glucose inside the myocardium. 
There are a lot of data that looked at pet outcome and showed that those with mismatch do better if they um, if they are revascularized and there is significant improvement in LV function. But a common question that always comes, how much scar can I tolerate and how much mismatch I need? So to be able to get that, this is one of the landmark studies done by Dr. Beanlands in Ottawa, looking at how much scar you need to have. So two things might help determine if the ejection fraction is going to improve. The first one is the scar burden. And for this, if there is small scar burden, the chance of improvement in LV dysfunction, the, the absolute change here was 10%. If there is moderate scar burden, 16 to 27.5 in this study, the change in the EF was like almost 6%. And it is much less among those with large scar. But also, you need to have enough hibernating myocardium, which in this study made it significant by 7%. So you need to have the combination to be able to, for the patient to improve in their LV, dysfun in the LV ejection fraction. First, they need to have low scar, but at the same time, they need to have enough myocardium, which is jeopardized by relieving that jeopardy than by revascularizing them then these patients will have improvement in their LV function. So very important concept, low scar and a lot of myocardium at risk. Another common question that become addressed to us, like how do these imaging modalities correlate, specifically FTG PET and CMR? We know that FTG PET is more sensitive uh, based on the meta-analysis I showed you earlier, but how does it correlate in terms of infarct transmurality and infarct size? There is good correlation overall in this study, but you can see that it's better for predicting infarct transmurality, more heterogeneity for predicting the infarct size, which may speak to the higher spatial resolution of MRI in these patients. However, if you do a lot of these studies like simultaneously among these patients, you will find a group of multiple patients that may have heterogeneity in their, like how what you find on one study versus the other. I'll show you one recent case that we had a few weeks ago. This is a 40-year-old lady who came in with VFRS. So she was outside the hospital, had a VFRS. She was resuscitated by EKG. The first EKG showed uh, inferior STEMI. She was taken uh, to the cath, which showed an occluded RCA. The question is, shall we open it up or it is all cute? The wall was echinetic or echocardiography. So we were asked to do both stress and viability. So even to start with viability, there is an inferior perfusion defect that you see here, and but there is significant ischemia. And someone can say you can stop at that point and tell them it is viable. But there is enough viability based on the ischemia that you have to go and try to open that vessel. Interestingly, this patient had zero calcium score and their ejection fraction was still uh, relatively preserved at 59%, and their flows indicate that it was only a single vessel disease. When we look at the viability, even though it's been like a few days since the event, you can see that the scar, although it looks here big on the perfusion, it's not that bad. It's only a small scar here, like 5% in the inferior wall. But you can see here that there is significant FTG uptake in the inferolateral wall and inferoceptal walls, as with, which are the areas that are ischemic. So this patient also had an MRI like within 24 hours. And you can see that there is late gadolinium enhancement here that is available, that is uh, shown here. And with this late gadolinium enhancement uh, appears to be more from the acute type kind of grayish 
but this is a uh, this was by MRI noted to be much more scar burden compared to what we saw on PET, like the five percent, which may be a difference because of the edema, because a late gadolinium enhancement might pick edema, while we here we didn't we're less sensitive to that. Obviously, there's an LV clot that we did not see by PET, and this is one of the strengths of MRI here. Now there are a lot of push to try to, in many cases, we may need both modalities. And you can see here, there are cases that have concordant message where it is viable on both or scarred on both. But there are some situations where it may not be viable despite limited gadolinium enhancement, late gadolinium enhancement, or vice versa, the other case that I showed you at the acute phase where some of the late gadolinium enhancement may be from edema rather than from true scarring. So the randomized data for PET came from the part two trial where patients were randomized to get either a PET guided management versus standard of care. And the study was did not meet its primary endpoint. And the reason for that is because the adherence rate to the PET recommendation, although it's a PET guided management, it was not followed and nearly 50% among those with 50-50, and still among those with high viability, still about 20% did not uh, me, did not follow the PET-guided management. And when the data was analyzed as on treatment, it did show superiority for that, for PET-guided management versus standard of care, which is at least hypothesis generation among those who adhere to PET recommendations recommendation versus standard of care. So to sum it up, where is myocardial viability right now? And I think right now there is a change in the face of assessment of viability. So the way we utilize viability right now is a little bit different than what we are doing in, uh, when we were doing 20 years ago which is mostly now focusing on revascularization strategy, whether we want to do PCI versus cabbage. Do we need to get complete revascularization or some of the territories are scarred and can get away with the PCI of some other territories. But we are also seeing single vessel decision for revascularization as the case I showed you. We're seeing a lot of cases that are for selection of CTO, whether you want to do uh, revascularization or not for these patients. But there is also a lot of utilization among the heart failure group, mostly for risk stratification and assessment of uh, prediction of CRT and other advanced therapies. And finally, there is a new role that's kind of picking up for valvular heart disease, namely among patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation or low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. And the reason for all of these modalities being used is simply because there is not one risk fa one factor that will predict the outcome of these patients. Because here you see that even the different modalities have a positive predictive value in the 70s and negative predictive value also in the 70s. And this is simply because it's not only viability that will determine the outcome of these patients, but rather the patient risk for surgery, all the different comorbidities that the patient has, the suitability of target vessels for revascularization, the magnitude of hibernation and ischemia as just showed you, the baseline LV ejection fraction, the LV size and degree of LV remodeling, the magnitude of scar, and also how long this cardiomyopathy been going on and the time to revascularization. And while viability is one factor, there are many other factors that should be taken into consideration when looking at these. And here I'm gonna finish up with this slide showing you the different uh, 
modalities that can be used for uh, for viability assessment and focusing more on SPECT and PET techniques, you can see PET has um, uh, looking at both the perfusion and metabolism. It's now starting to become more widely available than before, given the increase in use of PET for oncology procedures. It is an expensive test, though it is very sensitive, good specificity, and has been well validated. And that's why you're seeing more of a shift from SPECT to PET for assessment of myocardial viability and for decision-making uh, guidance. Thank you for your attention, and we'll take questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Almala for a very nice overview of where we are in nuclear and, and PET imaging uh, for viability. I'd like to remind our audience that they can submit their questions in two ways. One, either go to the web, go to polev.com and uh, enter Debakey, or text uh, Debakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607. All right, uh, Dr. Shah. Uh, tell us uh, the latest on CMR and how do we use it right. for assessment of viability. Okay, uh, I'm sharing my screen. Are you guys seeing it? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, I think that the if you look at it, uh, CMR is probably the, the newest of the imaging modalities for assessment of myocardial viability. With really the the early studies uh, for this being done in the late 1990s and early 2000s, but I think over the last 20 years it has really uh, achieved a very prominent role in viability assessment for two reasons. I think one is there's very strong histopathologic validation in animal studies, and there's extensive clinical validation in human studies, and obviously, uh, as we'll touch on, uh, viability assessment by MRI involves the use of gadolinium-based contrast agents. Um, in the early days, we used to use more of these linear-based agents. Now, what we use predominantly are macrocyclic agents where the gadolinium is completely uh, surrounded uh, by chelates. And as you'll see now, uh, conditions like renal failure no longer represent a absolute contraindication to gadolinium administration. So let's talk about the early studies uh, with the uh, animal studies that uh, demonstrated uh, validation against histopathology. So this is one here where uh, an infarct was created within the LED territory. And uh, you can see on the left-hand side is the histopathologic sections. On the right-hand side is the gadolinium-enhanced MRI. This is high-resolution ex vivo imaging. And if I draw your attention to one particular panel and look at it in detail, you can see that, that the, uh, what you see uh, or what we see as hyper-enhancement uh, on the gadolinium MRI almost matches exactly to what you'd be able to see uh, at the time of autopsy. So you've really got the ability now in a non-invasive way to directly look at the myocardium uh, and look for islands of, of uh, myocardial fibrosis as well as viable myocardium. And in fact, this study was followed about 10 years later by another study in a small animal model in mice where they did uh, ultra high resolution imaging down to 50 microns. And you'll notice again, what you see on the histology as fibrosis is directly tracked with what you see on the MRI as areas of hyper enhancement. Um, and in fact, at this very high resolution level, uh, the LGE really identified even small clefts of viable cardiomyocytes that were two to four cells th thick. Um, so really, the, the mechanism behind uh, delayed enhancement uh, really tracks what you see uh, down to almost a cellular level. Now, what about in humans? So this was one of the early studies in humans, uh, which was 2000, so about 20 years ago, uh, looking at a series of patients with known myocardial infarction. Uh, who are presenting for follow-up imaging in the chronic phase. Uh, and you can see areas of hyper-enhancement in this patient in the anterior wall, in this patient in the circumflex, and in this patient in the right coronary artery distribution. Um, and, and then there were patients that had very small infarcts. Uh, this patient here had a CK rise, a CKMB of only 12. Uh, yet you can see hyper-enhancement in the infarct-related right coronary artery territory. 
Um, and so I think the, the reason for this is, one, the MRI is able to directly image both the myocardial scar as well as the viable myocardium and the very high spatial resolution that we achieve in clinical humans, uh, 1.5 by 1.5 millimeters, uh, and a very high contrast to noise between normal myocardium and between uh, a scarred myocardium. Um, and then again, this can be done without radiation exposure. And in fact, the way that we do this technique clinically um, really involves putting an IV in, patient goes into the scanner, we'll typically get a set of cine images, which allow us to look at morphology and function, and then uh, inject gallinium contrast agents, wait about five or 10 minutes, and then perform the delayed enhancement MRI imaging, which uh, identifies the presence of myocardial infarction or scar. Um, and so let's look at some of the early studies that were done validating this beyond the direct histopathologic validation. And so this was kind of the classic study uh, looking at patients that were scheduled for revascularization. Uh, they all were brought in to undergo a CINE MRI and a delayed enhancement MRI to assess myocardial viability, and then to see if viability on the MRI predicted functional improvement after revascularization. Uh, and here's an example case. Uh, this is a patient who has moderate LV dysfunction, as we can see, with regional variation. And uh, on the delayed enhancement MRI, I'll draw your attention to three distinct areas. The inferior wall, which has a uh, moderate amount of hyperenhancement. The anterior wall, which has almost transmural hyperenhancement. And then the lateral wall and the septal walls, which really have no hyperenhancement at all. And this patient, after revascularization, the ejection fraction improved from 30% to 45%. And if you look at those areas, that anterior wall that we saw nearly transmural hyperenhancement shows no improvement in contractility after revascularization. This inferior wall, which uh, had kind of a moderate amount of hyperenhancement, shows some marginal improvement in contractility. And you'll notice the best improvement in the lateral wall, where contractility goes from being severely hypokinetic to almost uh, normal kinetic. And in fact, uh, in this series, um, the relationship between the likelihood of improvement in contractility after revascularization was directly related to the transmural extent of hyperenhancement, with those segments that had no hyperenhancement having a greater than 80% likelihood of contractile improvement versus those segments with more than 75% hyperenhancement, essentially having no likelihood of improvement in contractility. And there's been several studies uh, after this initial landmark study that have uh, also demonstrated this finding. A couple of unique features, I think, is if you look specifically at those segments that are akinetic or dyskinetic, so in other words, the most dysfunctional regions, in fact, the positive predictive value actually gets stronger. And in this case, over 90% of segments with no hyperenhancement, but with akinesis or dyskinesis actually showed improvement after revascularization. And then obviously none of the segments uh, with more than 75% hyperenhancement showed any improvement in contractility. Uh, on a global basis, there's also a relationship between the extent of the LV that's dysfunctional but viable and the change in ejection fraction after revascularization. And if we want to use a 5% threshold to say, if I want to see a 5% improvement in ejection fraction, that's corresponded to about a 25% of the left ventricle that was dysfunctional but viable. So again, you need a certain mass of, or volume of dysfunctional but viable myocardium to be able to demonstrate a clinically significant improvement in global ejection fraction. Now, the other thing I'll draw your attention to is in addition to chronic CAD, uh, there's also studies looking at patients that came in with acute myocardial infarction, and again, showing the same inverse relationship. As there's more hyperenhancement, there's more or there's lower likelihood of improvement in recovery of function. And then, in fact, also in patients with chronic heart failure who are just getting medical therapy with beta blockers, viability by MRI also predicts likelihood of improvement uh, uh, in function after medical therapy as well. Now, what you're dealing with, though, is, is a variety of different pathophysiologies, but yet what is the underlying mechanism by which uh, MRI is able to identify viability? And it has to do with this uh, mechanism that's shown right here, which is gallinium is an extracellular contrast agent. So it doesn't permeate into or through into intact cell membranes. So in normal myocardiums where you have 
intact cell membranes with nice, tightly packed myocytes, there's very little volume of distribution for gadolinium, and therefore there's a small amount of gadolinium uptake. Compare that to a patient who has an acute infarct, where now the cell membranes are no longer intact, and the gadolinium then is able to distribute both in the extracellular space as well as in the intracellular space because of a uh, uh, lack of uh, um, uh, uh, it, you know, membrane integrity of the myocytes. And then in a chronic setting, which again is a very different histopathology, you have now a loose matrix of collagen fibers where again, there's an expansion of the acceller space. And as a result, you have an increased volume of distribution for gadolinium. So really the, the unifying mechanism is really that what you see as hyperenhancement represents the absence of intact viable myocyte integrity. Now, let's look at some special uh, situations. So one is, is patients who have significant regional wall thinning. So in this series, we looked at patients with a wall thickness of less than 5.5 millimeters. Um, and here's an example of one patient who has a very large area of wall thinning. And when we do our late gallium enhancement MRI, you can see extensive hyperenhancement in this area. So extensive wall thinning and extensive scarring. Compare that to a second patient here who also has a large area of wall thinning here all along the anterior wall and apex. But when you do the uh, delayed enhancement MRI, you only see a subendocardial rim of hyperenhancement. And in fact, if I show you this two chamber view right here, we can actually quantify what the transmural extent of this wall that's hyperenhanced is. Uh, and it only represents about 25 to 30% of this wall. Uh, so this is a case where you have wall thinning, but you really have limited scar by MRI. Um, and this patient went on to get revascularized and the ejection fraction, as you can see at baseline, which is around 30%, improved after a Lima to LED graft to 50%. And you'll notice that anterior wall, which was dyskinetic before, now has actually started to regain contractile function. And also interestingly, that anterior wall uh, thickness has gone from about four and a half millimeters now to a normal wall thickness of about nine millimeters. So there's actually a reversal of wall thinning as well. Um, and, and this is what was seen in the data here, which is that for those patients who had less than 50% scarring within the thinned region, uh, after revascularization, they demonstrated improvement in systolic wall thickening. And they also demonstrated a reversal of LV thinning uh, after revascularization. But that did not occur in those obviously with more than 50% scar within the thin region. So I think you know this one subgroup of patients, those with myocardial thinning is one area where CMR may be able to identify uh, the presence of viability and potential reversibility, reversibility as well. Uh, how often did this occur? So in this series of, of about 200 patients that we looked at, uh, this phenomenon of wall thinning, despite having limited scar was present in about 18% of patients. So close to one in five patients uh, in a clinical setting did this uh, phenomenon occur? Now, here's an observational study that came out in 2012 that looked at patients uh, and classified them as, as either having significant viability by MRI or not, uh, based on having four segments that were dysfunctional but had less than 50% uh, infarction. And in this observational study, uh, it did show that those patients who had significant viability by MRI but who underwent medical treatment had a worse prognosis than the other groups of patients who had uh, 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 viability but went on to get revascularization. Um, now let's look at another example where again, this MRI technique of directly imaging the myocardial damage can be useful. And this is in the setting of a patient who presents with an acute MI uh, who underwent PCI of the left circumflex and you can see when we do our initial delayed enhancement imaging very early after gadolinium contrast, we see a large black area in the center here, which eventually fills in over time. And this is a, an example of microvascular obstruction. This is a phenomenon that occurs with large infarcts, uh, but it has independent prognostic significance beyond infarct size, as is shown in this publication here in Jack Imaging, with the group of patients that had an infarct size of more than 25% of the LV and microvascular obstruction, 
doing the worst. But for any infarct size, the presence of microvascular obstruction was associated with a worse prognosis, uh, even after adjustment for other clinical covariates. Um, uh, a couple other scenarios. Uh, here's a patient who presents with a inferior wall myocardial infarction. And you can see uh, with this direct high resolution ability to identify myocardial uh, infarction, we can see this person has, in fact, an associated right ventricular infarction as well. Uh, here's a patient on the right-hand side using now a newer dark blood delay enhancement technique where we can identify the presence of uh, hyperenhancement or fibrosis within the posterior medial pap muscle. Now, one of the things I think Dr. Almala touched on, which is, you know, there's a variety of reasons why a patient may benefit from revascularization uh, and, and uh, reasons uh, why a segment or myocardial region may improve or not improve contractile function after revascularization. Uh, and it extends beyond just viability imaging in and of itself. Uh, I want to go through a few of these um, and just kind of bring up a couple of concepts. Um, one of the things, though, I think I would you know, kind of point out to you as I think all the studies that we've done over the last two decades, I think, suggest that we really want to have a technique that has very high specificity uh, for identifying non-viability. And what I mean by that is you want, a, you want a technique that's not gonna falsely say an area is non-viable and not gonna improve when it's not. And I think that's one of the strengths of MRI, which is that when there's more than 75% enhancement, the likelihood of, of improvement in contractility uh, is almost zero. Um, and I think the other important thing to keep in mind is that viability, the physiology of viability is not dichotomous. Although we like to do sensitivity and specificity analysis and try to come up with a threshold, the reality is that, that the, the process itself is likely a, 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 a graded process and increasing viability is likely to be associated with increasing likelihood of recovery of function. Um, so the real physiology is much more probably like the left-hand side than this right-hand side kind of abrupt threshold uh, type process. A uh, couple other things to, to bring out. I think one of the things that you can do to, to improve your um, uh, evaluation in somebody who, you know, if somebody has very severe coronary disease, I think it's probably not as much of a question, but in somebody where the lesions are of uh, uncertain significance, you can see this person has significant kind of LV dysfunction but yet there's very little viability here or there's very little infarct here in the inferior wall and there's no infarct in the other areas is that we can couple this with stress perfusion imaging as well. Um, and you can see in this person that there's a large area of inducible ischemia here in the inferior wall. So again, I think, you know, all cases don't necessarily need uh, a stress uh, MRI, but I think in cases where the coronary lesions are of uncertain significance, those are cases where we're doing both the contrast at rest as well as stress can be beneficial. The other thing to keep in mind is also what's the time period at which you're assessing your recovery of function after revascularization? That can have an impact based on the amount of, uh, of scar that's present. So in this study, looking at patients with chronic total occlusion, so again, the most kind of extreme form of hypoperfusion, for those segments that showed less than 25% hyperenhancement, there was improvement within five months and further improvement out to three years. But for the intermediate segments, those with 25 to 50 or to 75% uh, hyperenhancement, if you image at five months, you would show no improvement in contractile function. But when these patients were imaged at three years, in fact, there was a significant improvement in contractile function. So again, if there's more severe resting hypoperfusion and hibernation, it may take longer to manifest an improvement in contractile function. And then obviously those patients with more than 75% hyperenhancement, those segments did not show improvement either early at five months or at uh, three years in the chronic phase. Um, two other concepts I think I'm going to touch on real quickly here is when we're assessing viability, it's actually important to know more than just viability, to, to actually know what's viable as well as what's scarred, I think is crucial. And, and the reason is because there's an inherent variability in the amount of viability that occurs within any given heart. So here's a normal volunteer, one of our fellows, for example, that, that volunteered for uh, a scan. And if I draw the endo and epi contours on this delayed enhancement MRI, you can see there's significant variability. And if I lay this out for you, you can see the amount of viable myocardium 
across the circumference of this short axis slice varies. Um, and in this other patient here who presented with an inferior wall non-STEMI, if I just look at viability, I would not be able to really tell that there is a presence of an infarct. But if I have the ability to also image scar or infarction, then you can identify that in fact, there's a small subendocardial infarction that's present. The other concept I wanna bring up is again, why it's important to know more than just how much is alive, but also to know how much is dead or how much is scar is this example scenario here, where if we look at the delay enhancement in patient C and patient D, both of these patients have a viable rim that's black, which is about equal in size. But in this patient, this is a normal wall thickness with a large amount of hyper enhancement this is not going to improve contractile function versus this patient D on the bottom here, where there's a very limited amount of scar, despite the fact that there's a, a small amount of viable myocardium. And this person, again, was the example I showed you where there's actually significant improvement in contractility after revascularization. And then lastly, how long does it take to perform a delayed enhancement MRI? Well, there's now these uh, sub-second kind of single shot acquisition techniques where literally the acquisition can be done in the amount of time it takes to play this movie. This can be no breath holding, no arrhythmias or, or independent arrhythmias, irrespective of gating, um, and can be done typically in about a minute or so. And, and we do this in all cases to get a quick survey uh, before we do then our high res imaging. And this quick survey alone can give you 87% sensitivity and 96% specificity for identification of myocardial infarction. Now, what are some special considerations? So, you know, one is I think there's no dietary preparation that's required. You do need to get gadolinium-based contrast agents. But again, I think with the use of macrocyclic agents, those are not a, a absolute contraindication any longer. Pacemakers are generally not a problem, but sub-Q ICDs can sometimes be a problem because they sit very close to the heart, more from the standpoint of imaging artifact. Uh, and then also patients that have especially biventricular ICDs can cause a large amount of artifact. And those are patients where you might need to use specialized pulse sequences. And then lastly, a patient who has a balloon pump or LVAD, those are patients obviously that cannot undergo an MRI scan. So with that, I will uh, uh, leave it here. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Deepan, for, uh, for a great discussion here of, uh, of MRI. And, um, you know, just thinking about our utilization of of uh, these imaging modalities. When do you see, I'm, I'm gonna ask, um, address the question to both of you because nowadays, truly, dobutamine echo is used but not as much as before having in our armamentarium certainly PET as well as CMR. Uh, do you see an advantage of one versus another since we're talking about high advanced imaging here? So, I mean, I, I guess maybe I'm a little biased here. I, you know, I would say, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the scenarios that I brought out, patients with certainly uh, ICDs, especially by the ICDs, those are cases where it can be challenging sometimes to uh, get a complete uh, assessment of the LV by MRI. The sub-Q ICDs also sometimes, depending upon where they sit, could sit very close to the anterior wall of the heart and could cause a large amount of artifacts. So I think those are cases where um, you know, if all other things being equal, you know, you may want to think about going to a PET versus MRI. But I think in, in large number of cases, this kind of ability to directly visualize a myocardium, I think, uh, is very unique. I think one area where people maybe haven't utilized as much is coupling the, the delayed enhancement MRI with a stress perfusion as well, which I think can, can uh, uh, potentially help with decision making, especially in people with kind of borderline uh, uh, significant corners. A perspective from you, Moaz? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Deepan. In most cases, you can interchange them, at least from a PET perspective. The difficult ones are really the insulin dependent who use a lot of insulin. So this might be a challenge in cardiac PET. Uh, although we can like have our tricks around it, but I think that might be a problem uh, sometimes. Uh, the other thing, other than that, I think we can uh, have uh, good assessment of the myocardium and in terms of viability. Uh, situations where I, where I would prefer uh, like 
pet versus the other. I mean, Deepan kind of mentioned the uh, limitations with ICDs, and uh, sometimes, like, if there is a like a uh, and some sites where renal failure may be an issue although now we are able to we're using the newer agents from the delinium that's not an issue anymore but uh, there are some sites that are kind of limited with that uh, still uh, but other than that most often we are able to follow uh, to get equal kind of situations but overall, there has been a drop in the utilization of viability in general. And now, the, really, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg, the most sick patients, frail, multiple comorbidities, elderly, remodeled LV, multiple, uh, multiple subendocardial scars, which kind of sometimes make it in a situation where it's not black and white. People want to believe it's viable, non-viable. And it is, there's always this gray zone, which is we are seeing more often given the type of patients that we are seeing now. I fully agree yeah, with no, you. I, that that, I fully I, agree I would, with you. I think the, uh, the, the, the number of referrals for viability has dropped. I mean, conceivably also because uh, many of the concerning high-risk procedures are lesser high-risk procedures nowadays. And if there is any, any evidence of ischemia in somebody who has uh, depressed ventricular function, uh, probably go for revascularization, even off-pump bypass. So uh, uh, I think, um, you know, I agree that it's becoming uh, an issue of, is this a completed infarction? Yes, no, particularly in situations of CTO, et cetera, where it's much more difficult to do. And in the big questions of VAD transplantation versus revascularization, I think, uh, you know, advanced heart failure, if you will. Do you guys agree? Yeah, I would agree. I think that really oftentimes now the decision that uh, is kind of sought from viability testing is not do I revascularize or not, but rather do I send this person for cabbage or do I send them for high-risk PCI? Got it. And I think regarding uh, echocardiography per se, I mean, it's, it's almost a daily event, although it is not referred particularly for such, right? You're going to look at changes in wall motion, let's say, during the bunibine and somebody who has some depression and ventricular function. You're going to look for ischemia in addition to viability in those segments. So the interpretation is there. The referral just for viability is certainly much less than before. All right. Well, with that, I mean, if I'm going yeah. to add one thing. I mean, our program, at least the PET program, has been up now for like almost 18 months, and we've done about 150 viabilities. So uh, you can see that it is not an everyday procedure, but it is still needed for multiple patients, especially with the kind of referrals we're getting here. All right. Well, with that, we thank you for your engagement. We thank you for, for joining us today. And thank you again, uh, uh, Dr. Shah and Dr. al -Malah for your contributions. See you next week. Thank you.